As we get closer to the orange and white game this coming up Saturday in the end of spring practices, the Texas football team participated in their second scrimmage of the uh, spring this past Saturday. And I'll tell you everything you need to know offensively and defensively. You are locked on Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show is Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets guarantee. That's $150 bucks, win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, we are discussing everything you need to know offensively and defensively from the second scrimmage. My takeaways from what took place this past Saturday. In the second segment, Ronnie Terry is on fire in the transfer portal, bringing in three high-level players to compete on this Texas basketball team in their inaugural season in the SEC. And then in the last segment, the Texas baseball team dropped the first game of the series against Houston on Friday night, but then scored the go-ahead run in the ninth inning on Saturday and Sunday to take the series in dramatic fashion. All of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It has been a hell of a morning, right? A hell of a morning. As you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm holding my mic in my hand because my mic stand keeps falling down. Um, and hopefully I can maintain the same sound quality. I'm right-handed, but my phone will be in my right hand, right? So, uh, you know, hopefully I can keep my left hand steady for the next 20 to 30 minutes. This mic is kind of heavy, you know, unsurprisingly. Um, and then, you know, my Internet kept going in and out. So I kept having to start it over. Right. This is my second time recording this. So it's just been a lot. But thankfully, you know, there's some really good topics today. And I felt like I just had to, uh, you know, talk my stuff. Right. Because normally I would have been like, man, you know, it's too much bad stuff happening this morning. I'm kind of naturally lazy. I'm you know, just being honest with you. So I probably would have just said, you know what? Today's not my day. I'll start tomorrow. But. Uh, like I said, it was a lot to talk about today. It was a huge weekend, so we're going to figure out a way to make this happen, even if, even if I got to hold the mic with my left hand for 30 minutes, right? So in the first segment, we're talking about uh, the you know second scrimmage of the spring that took place this past Saturday. Um, and once you get to this point of the offseason, we're now about halfway through. Right. Our first game is uh, August 31st against Colorado State. The longest offseason in the world is moving fast. Right. Surprise. Um, but you start to develop themes about this Texas football team, right? You start to understand who's going to have a huge role on this football team and who maybe needs more development. What are potential strengths for this football team and what are potential weaknesses, right? Obviously, some of the stuff you have you hear at this point, you have to take with a grain of salt, right? But a lot of the stuff you're hearing, good or bad, is representative of what you may see on the football field come August 31st and beyond. Now, obviously, who they are on April 15th is not who they'll be on August 31st. They're not who they will be at the end of the season. They still have a ton of room for growth, development, and knowledge, right? Learning and getting better each and every day. But a lot of the stuff you're hearing now will also be true once the season kicks off, right? Everything I'm about to talk about or take away or react to is sourced from inside Texas and Horns 24-7. They do a really good job of bridging that gap between us and our favorite teams at the University of Texas. And, I mean, with their reporting, they make me feel like I'm in the locker room. I'm at the scrimmage. I'm at the practice damn near, right? So they do such a good job. All the credit in the world to those two entities. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the pass rush. It seems like the pass rush showed up in a big way uh, this past Saturday at the scrimmage. Four different players were mentioned as recording sacks, and that's without Trey Moore, who was mentioned as being limited in the scrimmage. Not sure if it's injury related or not, but it does not seem like cause for concern at all. Right. Seems very minor and does not seem like anybody is worried about it. When I talk about the pass rush showing up in a big way this past Saturday, Baron Sorrell had multiple sacks. Colin Simmons for the second straight scrimmage, his first two scrimmages at the University of Texas, had a sack. That's great for the all-world prospect out of Duncanville. Jare Bledsoe, who got rave reviews this past Saturday, had a sack. And Zena Umiazulu recorded a sack as well, right? So, you know, when we look at it, this was a championship-level team last year. They won the Big 12, and they want to be a championship-level team this year on a different level, one in the SEC and a new conference, but, you know, once again, winning your conference. And two, we won what Michigan got last year. Like, we want to be champions of the world. We want to be national champions. And to do that, you have to identify, you know, where your potential weaknesses were the year before and how you can turn those into strengths. 
it wasn't a weakness for us last year, I would say, the pass rush, but it could have been a lot better, right? And it kind of culminated in that game against Washington. I think this staff has done everything in their power to make this a strength going into the 2024 season in the SEC, and it sounds like they've done a good job of it thus far with five sacks in the scrimmage on Saturday, none of them coming from Trey Moore, who recorded 22 and a half of those the last two years at UTSA. Huge roles to fill up front in the interior defensive line uh, with Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat moving on to the National Football League. We have an idea of who will be in that role in terms of like who will be starting, who's going to be dipped in the role, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't know who's going to be the guy, right? Like who can follow what Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy did last year for this football team for 14 games? Who can reach maybe not that same level of production, but you know, equivalent to being one of the best defensive tackles in the country. And maybe a player none of us were thinking about is Jare Bledsoe. This is a direct quote from Horns 24-7. The defense up front, especially Jare Bledsoe, was just making life tough for the running backs. Bledsoe seemed like he was everywhere against the run in the past. If he can play like that, he'll be in the rotation for sure, right? So right now we have guys in that room. Alfred Collins, Vernon Broughton, Sadir Mitchell, Jare Bledsoe, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't know who's going to step up and be the alpha, be the leader, be the guy that offensive coordinators and offenses are scared to, you know, go at in the middle of that defensive line. And potentially this season, it could be Jare Bledsoe, who's kind of been a tweener between the edge and the defensive tackle room since he arrived on campus. He has a huge opportunity to break out and be one of the best players on the defense this year. Sounds like he had a really good day this past Saturday. Run fits and tackling continue to be a theme of issues for Texas. This is two weeks in a row in the scrimmage where we've heard about bad run fits and bad tackling. And Texas, for the second week in a row, offensively went three for three in the red zone portion. So obviously that's not good for the Texas defense. Um, bread, our bread and butter last year was our run defense, being able to run the ball and being able to stop the run. One of our foundations, our fabric last year, was being able to stop the run. We had the number three run defense in the country. If you want to be a championship level football team, once again, whether that be in the SEC or national champions, you cannot afford a huge drop off in terms of being able to stop the run, right? Will you be the third ranked run defense again in the country without Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy? Probably not, but that cannot go from a strength to a liability for you if Texas wants to reach their ceiling and it sounds like in two straight practices they have had trouble especially in the red zone getting into their run gaps being disciplined being where they're supposed to be and also just tackling getting the ball carrier on the ground once again if those are not strengths for this football team this year and more importantly if those are liabilities for this football team this year then we could see the texas football team take a huge step back as a whole but once again who you are on april 15th does not have this does not mean that's who you will be on august 31st and they have plenty of time to figure it out hopefully they figure it out. Malik Muhammad was listed as the star of the scrimmage, intercepting Arch Manning, as well as deflecting two other passes. By the end of the season, I believe we'll be talking about him as one of the best corners in the country. Kobe Black, a true freshman, one of eight or nine players, I think that can make an impact from that room right now, had two pass deflections as a true freshman this past Saturday in the scrimmage. Some of the back end rotations were interesting to me. I'm not saying they were wrong. I'm not saying I would have done anything differently. I'm not at the practices. All I'm saying is they were interesting to me. Like, don't read between the lines on that one. Just listen to what I said. Jade Barron didn't participate, so that also probably played a role in some of the interesting rotations, right? Gavin Holmes was with the ones with Malik Muhammad and Terrence Brooks and Warren Robinson were your second team corners. That was interesting to me. Andrew Makuba was at second team safety behind Michael Taff. That was interesting to me. Nothing more, nothing less. Now get into the offensive side of the ball. Quinn Ewers was listed as one of the best players on the day. It's always good to hear your franchise quarterback, your leader at that position, had a really good day going against the defense and real, you know, uh, work in pads, right? But it was reported he was constantly under duress and multiple receivers had multiple drops. So overall, the passing game was not crisp this past Saturday. Jonte Cook and Isaiah Bond were the two players that were mentioned as having multiple drops and did not have great days in the scrimmage this past Saturday. Also, I want to talk about Quinn Ewers being constantly under duress. He did get sacked more times last year than he did, uh, you know, kind of his red shirt freshman season. But I didn't think the offensive line was bad last year in terms of pass blocking. But, you know, when you look at it this year, you are replacing your right tackle and Christian Jones, a right tackle that's about to go in either the third or fourth round of the NFL draft, possibly. So that's a National Football League player, and he's a really good player, and he's been a stalwart for us on the right side of that offensive line the last two years. Now you're moving to Cam Williams, who we've heard about having some trouble in pass pro, having some trouble moving his feet, staying in front of those athletic edges on the outside. Also, the interior offensive line at times – 
over the last two years has been a struggle for us, right? We've also seen Quinn Ewers has not shown a high ability or an ability to play at a high level under pressure. And that's nothing against Quinn Ewers because most quarterbacks can't play at a high level under pressure. But for the most part, Quinn Ewers has shown us that he still is a quarterback that needs everything around him to be ideal for his play to be ideal. And if his blind side, if he has to worry about getting hit every play, right, or if he has to worry about getting hit, period, because the offensive line can't hold up in front of him, we're not going to see the best version of Quinn Ewers. So we need to make sure that we are shoring up that offensive line and we are a really good pass blocking unit and a really good run blocking unit because we have too much talent on the outside to not be able to, to effectively use it because we can't block up front. And once again, the offensive line and the defensive line is the foundation of everything you do, right? That's going to severely limit us offensively if we can't keep Quinn Ewers upright. Cedric Baxter and Jaden Blue were dominant, especially in the red zone. It's good to hear from your running backs. We know this is a power run football team. That's our bread and butter on that side of the ball. DeAndre Moore, Ryan Wingo, Juan Davis, and Amari Nyblack were pass catchers that were all mentioned as having really good days offensively. And the deep passing game was mentioned as still being a work in progress. And that has been a theme since Steve Sarkeesian has been here uh, in 2021, right, or came in 2021. And when you look at it, this is a Texas football team that can be efficient, right? They can drive down the field and score on those 10 to 12 play drives. But you don't want to put that type of pressure on yourself every time you take the field. You want to be able to go out, especially with the weapons you have, and, you know, score on a 75-yard passing play or a 60-yard passing play or a 50-yard passing play, whatever. You need those big chunks to take pressure off your offense and not have to execute 10 to 12 times every time you get the ball. Sometimes it's those two to three play drives that get you a quick seven get off the field, get the defense back on the field, and that's how you win games, especially in Steve Sarkeesian's offense. And that deep pass of game is going to open up everything else, especially in the middle for our tight ends and our slot receivers and then our running backs in that power run game. So the deep passing game has been a work in progress since Steve Sarkeesian arrived in 2021. And hopefully by the time it matters, we can start connecting on those deep shots because that's going to open up everything else in our offense. It's going to increase the efficiency of our offense and our ceiling is going to be a lot higher if Quinn Ewers can hit players like DeAndre Moore, Ryan Wingo, Isaiah Bond, Jontae Cook, and Matthew Golden down the field and get those quick scoring drives instead of putting that pressure on you to have to efficiently drive down the field in 8 to 12 plays every single time. That's going to lead to turnovers. That's going to lead to drops. That's going to lead to you know just not executing, and that's going to lead to points being left on the board. But overall, it sounds like really good things coming out of the scrimmage this past Saturday with a few things that need to be cleaned up by the time the season starts. A quick word from our sponsors, and we get into Rodney Terry's dominant weekend in the transfer portal. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the National Basketball Association and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything. From slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win with FanDuel, America's number one. Sportsbook. All right. When you looked at this basketball team last year, um, I wouldn't say they underachieved. You know, I didn't think they were one of the 16 best teams in the country. Now, they probably should have gotten to the Sweet 16, you know, but Dylan Dessou and Max Aismith just shot horribly in the NCAA tournament. But I didn't think they were one of the 16 best teams in the country. And obviously, anything can happen in the NCAA tournament. So they got there. They got a win. Uh, got to the round of 32 and played against a really tough Tennessee team, right? And you didn't have much margin for error in the way that, you know, Dylan DeSue and Max Aceman shot. We needed a lot, you know, of margin for error. When you look at it last year, I think that this team struggled in terms of their outside shooting, right, from the mid-range and the three-point line. I think this team struggled in terms of just playmaking and ball handling, right, having consistent point guard play, not turning the ball over and being able to efficiently run the offense and getting the ball to your shooters and, you know, other playmakers on the offensive side of the ball, um, 
you know, rebounding was an issue, you know, last year for this basketball team. They just they just weren't clean. Right. They just weren't clean um, and ultimately had a lot of guys. Right. And when it came down to it, when you needed dynamic scores, when you needed players to put the ball in the hole, they just could not do that at a high level. And we saw that in that Tennessee game. And that's the reason that Texas did not make back to back sweet 16s, even though Tennessee gave Texas every opportunity to make back to back sweet 16s. And so, like, you know, we talked about in the last segment with Steve Sarkeesian and staff, you look at you know, what were your pitfalls last year, even though you had a really good season for football, right? What kept us from reaching our goals? And then you go out and attack those and try to make those strengths for the, you know, team the next season. Same thing with Ryan and Terry, right? I wouldn't say they had a great season. They made around a 32, but you look at what were your potential weaknesses last year. And I wouldn't even say they were potential. And then you figure out how can I make those strengths going into the 2024 season? I think he did a really good job of that, right? In terms of dynamic scoring being a weakness last year for this basketball team, outside shooting being a weakness for this basketball team last year, playmaking and things of that nature, and really just having high level talented players that can make plays when they needed to, right? Being aggressive and decisive. Those are all things that I think Texas struggled with last year. They did a great job this weekend and bringing in players in the portal that should help that a ton. The first one is Tremont Mark, right? That's who we're going to talk about. 6'6", 185 pounds from Dickinson, Texas, one of the most dynamic scorers in college basketball, is headed to the 40 Acres. Fifth year of college basketball. You love the experience. That's what wins in college basketball these days. He played three years at the University of Houston, so you know he has that defensive mindset under Kelvin Sampson, and then last year at the University of Arkansas. When you talk about his best games in the 2023 season, two of them caught my eye, one against North Carolina, one against Texas A&M. The first game against North Carolina, How about 34 points and five rebounds on 77% shooting? I believe he only missed five shots in that game total against North Carolina. Or how about against Texas A&M? 35 points, five rebounds, and three blocks on 53% shooting. He shot 22 free throws in that game. So putting up Zach Eady numbers from the free throw line. But seriously, the fact 34 points on 77% shooting or 35 points on 53% shooting just shows you his ceiling as a scorer. And he is the type of player that can give you 25 night in and night out. He's a three level scorer that can attack the rim from either side and can finish with either hand when he gets there, loves to get to that right elbow for mid range jumpers, right? That's his spot. He can get there and get that shot up with ease at any point. And he's really efficient and good at making it. Loves to shoot threes from the top of the key, either the left or the right wing. And he was one of the most efficient players in the country in terms of knocking down threes from those spots. He's a great pick and roll ball handler and passer. He had a 12 percent assist rate last year, but really just has a good feel for the game. Right. And that high pick and roll, that high ball screen coming off of it. If he needs to make plays offensively, once again, if he needs to get to a spot, if he needs to take a three, if he needs to get to the rim or if he needs to make plays for other out of that others out of that high ball screen, either the roller or playmakers on the three-point line. He can play off ball. His catch and shoot efficiency was in the 82nd percentile last season. For those like me who get confused about that, that means only 18% of players in the country last year were more efficient on catch and shoot opportunities than Tremont Mark was. 86 percentile score in isolation, averaging 1.1 points per possession. This means only 14% of players in the country last year were more efficient in isolation opportunities. And this means that every time he isolated last year for Arkansas, it was worth 1.1 points. That's very, very good. Very decisive on or off the ball plays with a constant aggressiveness. One thing that really made me mad last year, I wouldn't say made me mad, but one thing that really bothered me last year was sometimes Kendall Weaver would get the ball and not know what to do with it. Tyrese Hunter would get the ball and not know what to do with it. Max Aismas would get the ball and not know what to do with it. You're not going to have that concern with Tremont Mark. When he gets the ball, he's aggressive and decisive with it, and usually good things happen. Love that pickup. The second one, Jason Kent, 6'8", 205 pounds, another fifth-year player bringing a wealth of experience to the 40 acres. Spent his first two years at Bradley, last two years at Indiana State. And when you look at it, you know, Rodney Terry, two of the three players that he brought in from the portal were from Indiana State, the highest ranked net team ever to not make the NCAA tournament. They went to the NIT final and lost to a really good Seton Hall team by two points. Right. And our offense was very ugly last year for the most part. Like (laughs) a lot of times it was just really, really ugly, like a bunch of tough twos, a bunch of turnovers. Uh, you know, no, no player movement, no ball movement. Like it, it was just bad at times. Right. Indiana State conversely had one of the most beautiful offenses in the country. Right. So if your offense was ugly, theirs was beautiful and they have players in the portal. Why not go get two of their players? Right? Like this makes all the sense in the world. Don't overthink it. Our, our, our offense was ugly. Theirs was beautiful. We're going to go get two of their players, make our offense beautiful. 
Ronnie Terry did a good job of that. One of those being Jason Kent. His best game last year, ridiculous. 35 points and nine rebounds against SMU on just 12 shots. He only missed two, well, he missed one field goal in the game and one free throw. Went 11 and 12 from the line, two for two from the three point line. To show up to a basketball game and give your team 35 points on 12 field goals is insane, right? But that's the type of player he is. That's what you're getting at the 40 acres. Like Dylan Mitchell, he will play primarily in the dunker spot, and the majority of his scoring comes at the rim but the difference between dylan mitchell and jason kent is he has the versatility to space the floor dylan mitchell in two years at the 40 acres did not make a three-point shot 70 percent of jason kent's field goals come at the rim and 75 percent of his attempts come directly at the basket he's an excellent defensive and offensive rebounder something that texas struggled in last year he has an extremely high basketball iq especially as a pick and roll screener right that's where a lot of his you know buckets come from off of the pick and roll you know roll into the rim the major difference difference is 30 percent of his field goals come from the three-point line where once again dylan mitchell has yet to make his first three-pointer in college and if he enters the nba draft he would never would have made a three-pointer in college as a spot-up shooter he was in the 92nd percentile in the country last year averaging one two point one point two six points per possession we're talking about a power forward here at six eight right as a spot-up shooter he was in the 92nd percentile right so only eight percent of players in the country last year were more efficient in spot up opportunities than our new power forward jason kent right and every time he took a spot up jump shot it was worth 1.26 points that is insane right great get in the portal as a cutter he was even better 95th percentile so only five percent of players in the country were more efficient on cuts than jason kent was last year he averaged 1.7 points per possession on cuts last year so essentially every time he cut it was worth two points one of the best cutters in the country and that does so much for your offense in terms of his spacing at the three-point line and then being able to cut to the basket and how efficient he is when he gets there he can get out and run in transition for easy baskets as well so he can play the small ball five or the traditional four but most importantly he provides spacing and you have to guard him wherever he is on the court a huge get for the rodney terry and his texas basketball team you know, when I think when you look at Dylan Mitchell, he might be the better NBA prospect, you know, whatever that means. But when you look at Jason Kent, he's certainly the better college player and opens up so much for this offense that Dylan Mitchell just could not. I mean, I remember the BYU game last year. They didn't even guard Dylan Mitchell. Right. Like you have to guard Jason Kent. <laughs> that just plays a factor. It does. Then Julian Larry, right. The third get from the transfer portal, the second player from Indiana State, a guard, 6'3", 185 pounds from Frisco. So last year we brought Max Aspis back to Texas. We bring Tremont Mark back to Texas. We bring Julian Leary back to Texas. And we know Roddy Terry, right? Nobody has more state pride than that brother right there, right? 6'3", 185 pounds from Frisco. Best game last year. Neither one of these were efficient, but two, still two really good games in terms of, you know, the shots he was taking. But 20 points, four rebounds, and four assists, you know, that was a really good game. They had a 15-point, 10 assists, and five rebound game. That was really good as well. Uh, both of those games around 41% shooting, I believe. Uh, downhill score, right, at a guard position, 62% of his field goals come at the rim, even as a guard, right? So he's going to get to that cut analytical darling right <laughs> like this is who analytics like he's the poster child for analytics because he only takes threes and layups for the most part right like i was watching his highlight tape there's not a single mid-range shot on there like he's either getting to the three-point line or he's getting to the basket no in between if he's shooting in between he's probably at the foul line Excellent job driving to the left or the right side and being able to finish with either hand. Uh, excellent passer with a 22% assist rate, averaging 4.3 you know, assists last year. So that's something that I think this Texas basketball team needs this year, more consistent playmaking. Shoots over 40% from the left or wing or right wing three-point line. He's a 40, I think, 4 or 45% three-point shooter overall. And also boasted 99th percentile catch-and-shoot efficiency last year, averaging 1.38 points per set points per possession on spot up jumpers 1.38 points per possession on spot up jumpers every time he took a spot up jump shot it was worth 1.38 points that's ridiculous 99th percentile catch and shoot efficiency which means basically he's damn near the most catch you know most efficient catch and shoot player in the country right and that's something we lacked last year the ability to catch and shoot the ability to be wide open right you know, take advantage of the gravity of the defense and knock down open shots, right? He's one of the best in the country, if not the best in the country at that last year. And he plays the passing lanes extremely well on defense as well. So when you look at the three players that Texas brought in in the portal over the weekend, Rodney Terry and staff, they addressed some of the biggest holes that we had last year. And one of the reasons that the Texas basketball team cannot get past the round of 32 
huge additions to this Texas basketball team, huge talent, um, and some players that I think really should take this program to the next level, right? Especially with the addition of the three freshmen, Trey Johnson, uh, Nick Cody, and uh, it's Cam. I can't remember his last name right now, but the number one player in South Carolina. This should be a very good Texas basketball team, especially with players like Kendall Weaver and Caden Shedrick coming back for another year as well. A quick word from our sponsors, and then we get into the dramatic Houston, Texas baseball series, Houston and Texas baseball series that ended up with Texas winning the last two games, both by taking the lead in the ninth inning. All right, today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else. Even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. And remember, terms and conditions do apply all right getting into the baseball series between texas and the university of houston uh this weekend you know even though it was short-lived because this was houston's first year in the big 12 and texas last year <laughs> right in the big 12 it's good to see these teams who you know as rivalry goes back to before i was even born uh play a weekend series in baseball and now texas is 22 and 15 on the season after two straight victories and taking two out of three against the Houston Cougars over the weekend. It did not start off well on Friday. Texas lost nine to one by the fourth inning. Houston had a 3-0 lead uh, coming on a two-run homer and a run off of a wild pitch, a 3-0 lead coming on a two-run homer and a, a run off of a wild pitch. I don't know if I said that wrong or not. So it's been a long morning. Will Gasparino hit a solo bomb to make it 3-1, but that would conclude the scoring on the day for the Texas Longhorns. Houston would hit three more homers in this game after the fifth inning, ultimately ending with a score of 9-1. to one. But on Saturday, Texas was able to bounce back with a 6-5 to five victory. Texas took a 1-0 lead in the first inning quarter seat. Oh, my gosh. Texas took a 1-0 lead in the first inning courtesy of some two out magic, two singles and a walk following the first two outs. And then an RBI single and sack fly extended the Texas lead to 3-0 in the second inning. But Houston would get all three of those runs back in the bottom of the third to tie the score at three. Texas would hit two solo bombs in the fifth to take a 5-3 to three lead over Houston. But Houston came back with two solo homers of their own in the seventh inning to tie up 5-5. Five to five. So this game was tied 0-0. It was tied 3-3. And then it was tied 5-5. But D. Kennedy hit his second solo homer of the game, this time in the top of the ninth, which would give the Longhorns a 6-5 to five lead and the victory. That was just the first time this weekend that your Texas Longhorns took the go-ahead run in the ninth inning on Sunday, Texas won 13 to eight to take the series. One of the greatest comebacks you will ever see because Texas trailed by three going into the ninth and ended up winning by five in regulation, <laughs> which is crazy. They scored eight runs in the ninth inning alone. Ryan Galvin gave Texas a 2-0 lead in the third inning with a two run homer following a double by Gasparino in the third inning. Once again, the lead was short lived as LBJ gave up a three run homer in the bottom of that inning to give Houston a three to two lead. Houston would score four runs over the next two innings, extending their lead to seven to two going into the sixth inning. After two RBI doubles and an errant throw over two innings, Texas was able to cut the lead to seven to five going into the bottom of the eighth before Houston added some insurance, hitting a solo homer to make it eight to five going into the top of the ninth inning when the Longhorns were batting. Then the Longhorns would put together a historic top of the ninth to clinch the series. Jared Thomas hit a double after the leadoff hitter failed to reach. So this is crazy. They scored eight runs in the inning and the leadoff hitter didn't even reach. So Jared Thomas hit a double and they came around to score after an infield single and wild throw to first, making the score eight to six. Then Peyton Powell, not not at the game, tied the game at eight with a two run home run to make it eight, eight right in the top of the ninth. And then in the very next at bat, Jalen Flores hit a solo homer to give Texas a nine to eight lead 
after a walk. Max Bell, you hit a two run homer to make it 11 to eight. And then the Longhorns would hit three more singles in this game to make it 13 to eight before closing it out in the bottom of the ninth. And now they will face UT Rio Grande Valley on Tuesday at home. But a game in which it looked like you could lose all three of them to come out of it with a series win, to come out of it with two very clutch wins, taking the go ahead lead in the ninth inning on back-to-back days on Saturday and Sunday to win a game in which you trail three runs in the ninth inning on Sunday. The second time they've done that this season is just remarkable. It's magical, and hopefully they can build on it throughout the remainder of the season. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.